and to the uh, David R. Tillinghast Lecture. This is our 24th uh, David R. Tillinghast Lecture. I am David Rosenblum. I am the director of the International Tax Program. I know many of you in the room, and we have a full complement of our current uh, ITP students in the room. Uh, this year, we are uh, very happy and very honored to have as our Tillinghast lecturer, Barbara Angus, uh, whom, again, most of you know, Barbara has a very distinguished career in taxation and particularly international taxation. She has served on three separate occasions in the uh, United States government, twice in the Congress, uh, once in the uh, uh, Joint Committee and once in the Ways and Means Committee, and once as International Tax Counsel in the U.S. Treasury Department. So uh, she has a very thorough knowledge of how the government works. She was very much involved, uh, as she was telling us before, but will not be speaking about today, uh, the development of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. In addition, I think Barbara's had pretty close to two decades, if not two full decades, in private practice, in law firm, and in accounting firm. So I cannot think of anyone who would be uh, better qualified uh, to speak to us uh, this evening than Barbara. And so let us welcome her. And she is going to talk about international tax reform, the new frontier. Barbara. Thank you, David, for the invitation to present this year's Tillinghast Lecture. It's an honor to be a part of this annual event that uh, pays tribute to David Tillinghast's many contributions to the world of international tax. His is a name that I certainly remember from um, my first foray into the 900 sections of the code uh, back as a uh, tax, tax associate uh, in Chicago in the very early days of the Inter Internal Revenue Code of 1986. And so thank you all for being here to help um, remember his legacy. As I was, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I, I wondered more than once what, uh, what he would think about where we are today. Um, the, uh, as David said, my title is International Tax Reform, The New Frontier. I actually realized after I submitted that title that given my recent adventure on Capitol Hill that some would assume that I would be talking about TCJA um, 2.0, guiltier, more beat, um, <laughs> but that's not, what, that's not what I had in mind. So the new frontier that, that I was thinking about um, is multilateralism, um, sort of extreme multilateralism. Um, and so my focus is on the current OECD um, inclusive framework project on addressing the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And, and the emphasis um, for tonight is on the inclusive framework, um, which um, as, as of today um, um, stands at 134 jurisdictions. Um, can that large and that diverse a group of countries really work together to develop, agree, um, and implement a complex set of, uh, of international tax rules? Um, and can they apply those rules in the same way consistently on an ongoing basis? So the, the, the ambitions of this current OECD project um, would really break new ground for the, for the OECD. Yes, the, the BEPS project uh, paved the way, but this project seems different from the BEPS project in ways that make a real difference. Um, yeah, it's true that I, like I suspect many of, of you, um, was skeptical at the start of the BEPS project in 2013 and would not have pre predicted all the change that uh, has come from, um, from that project. Um, it's also true that uh, you can tell from my accent that I'm an American, so my view is, 
is likely colored by the, by the national tendency to want to chart our own way um, and to resist having, having to conform, um, both with respect to taxes and, and, and a lot of other things as well. Uh, plus, having recently been involved um, in the U.S. tax reform process, the thought of legislating in concert with 133 of one's closest friends um, is really daunting. Um, so, I, so I thought it would be, I, I was interested in, in um, taking, taking the time to look back at the recent um, and historic work of the OECD to see what it can tell us about the path for the current project. Is what the OECD um, undertaking now um, as unprecedented as it, as, it, as it seems, or is it really just an incremental move um, and extension of prior OECD activity? So my, my thinking tonight is to, uh, is to start by looking at the current project and the BEPS project um, with a focus on the similarities and the differences, and then turning to the inclusive framework um, through, this, through which this project is being done. What is it, ha, um, how does it operate, what has it, what has it done? Um, and then um, I will focus in particular on the work of the inclusive, inclusive framework on the BEPS mi minimum standards, which are the elements of the BEPS project for which countries made commitments. Um, and that kind of commitment is, uh, is central to the current project. Uh, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on some of the more traditional work of the OECD um, as well, and then finally I'll circle back um, to what this experience um, may, may tell us about the, the future of the current OECD project. So I have to say that as I, as I, as I dug into, uh, into that recent history, um, and spent um, time looking at the process, I was a little surprised by, by what I found. Um, the inclusive framework um, has been quite active um, since the release of, since its creation and the release of the final BEPS reports um, four years ago. And, and looking back at all of those documents now, some of the OECD's post-BEPS output, including some of the statements that they make, uh, really take on some new significance um, when you read them with the benefit of hindsight and with the knowledge of what the OECD is doing now, I feel a little bit if we parsed, uh, if we had parsed some of those words um, the right way, we could have predicted that this project would happen. Uh, but I guess that, that is the benefit of, uh, of hindsight. So, um, so starting first with how, how, um, how this project uh, compares to the, to the BEPS project. Um, how substantial and meaningful are the differences between the projects? So I, I thought about kind of the things that seem most significant um, to me about, about this current project. The, the project that has digital in its, in its name but goes well beyond digital and that um, um, intends to revise some of the cornerstone elements of the international tax system, the profit allocation rules and the nexus rules and replace them with new, more formulaic rules. And at the same time, in a separate project, um, developed new global minimum tax rules, um, which, is, which is really a completely new area for the, for, for the, for the OECD. Um, so um, I guess it, it, first, the f first thing that's, that, that, that to me is significant about this project um, is that it really goes to the core matter of, of taxing, of taxing, of, of right to tax and division of the right to tax. Um, and it is, a, it is a project that by its definition will involve winners and losers. For every country that gets an additional um, dollar of taxing rights, uh, for every market jurisdiction that gets the benefit of the additional taxing rights, some other country or countries have to give up a dollar of taxing rights. And are countries really prepared to do that and agree to do that and, and, and apply it consistently and systematically? Um, there are obviously revenue implications. Um, the, the project could be a significant revenue loser for countries that are not big market jurisdictions. Uh, and, um, and sort of fundamental taxing rights go to the core of, uh, of, 
of, of sovereignty for countries. It, it is what, it, it, is their, it is their basic right. Uh, and so something that has this, that, that causes this kind of change um, seems, seems pretty fundamental. Um, it also goes to the core matter of, uh, of tax rates, which is also a question of sovereignty. It wasn't um, that long ago. Um, it was in one of my prior stints um, in the government um, in the early 2000s, in 2001, when the OECD, working on the then referred to as Harmful Tax Practices Project, um, made a decision that it wasn't going to focus on tax rates and, and took the position, which it's followed since then, that, that, low ta that a low tax rate, rate itself is not something that, that is considered harmful or inappropriate competition, that tax rates are, uh, are, are about, they, they are sort of the definition of, of competition. And while the minimum tax rules in this project are not um, about um, dictating um, tax rates that a country must impose, the minimum tax rules would say if you choose to impose a rate below whatever is the agreed minimum rate, then other countries will be allowed, perhaps even encouraged, to take action um, and assert jurisdiction in some form over, over income that is, that is by rights your income. And that feels like um, it's hard to say that that isn't also a matter, a matter of sovereignty. Um, so 134 countries reaching agreement on, on those, those things, um, and that agreement holding year to year um, seems really ambitious. The, the project also, as I said at the outset, implicates fundamental building blocks of the international tax system. It moves away from, from, from principles that the OECD has advocated, proselytized about for many years, sort of moving away from the arm's length principle and replacing it with a formulaic approach um, who would have ever thought that the OECD would be advocating a direction in that uh, in that in that move, um, and 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 by doing that, it 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 deviates from the underlying economics, and so now you're asking countries to reach agreement, sustained agreement on something that isn't grounded in in principles in the, in the way that many believe the current system is. Um, it also involves incredibly complex technical issues. Difficult um, design questions for these new rules. How, 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 how are these new rules set up? How do you determine these formulas? And then on top of that, because the objective is not to completely replace the existing transfer pricing rules, there are, there are equally difficult design questions about how the new ro rules will mesh with the old rules. How to, how to make those connections. Um, so the, the fifth sort of um, component of this project that I think is, 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 is important and a challenge for the OECD is that it involves really complex uh, t tax administration issues. Um, it will require huge new, new and different types of information. Um, we just, the world, the, the BEPS project just brought us country by country reporting um, that, that, um, that, that information is not well suited for use for either of these two new elements of this project. In fact, it would be very dangerous if that information were used. So there'll need to be new, a new set of information um, that, that um, will have to be provided, collected, shared among countries, and evaluated and understood by tax administrations. Um, and then um, with all that we talked about before, um, it would seem um, um, obvious that it will put strain on already um, overtaxed dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. And so are there new mechanisms, are there new more multilateral mechanisms that, that can be created? Um, another thing that is, so the next item uh, with respect to this project is the fact that this is a project that needs full consensus of, of all participants. Um, so a consensus project where countries agree and commit to implement the rules that they have agreed to is, is not the norm for the, for the OECD. Um, and it was not, um, the, the, 
it, most of the BEPS project was not done um, on a consensus commitment basis. Most of the BEPS project was best practices and recommendations um, with the idea, and there was a lot of discussion at the time that, that, that there were frameworks um, set out and, uh, and that maybe eventually rules would converge, um, but it wasn't sort of a, a commitment uh, to implement um, and monitoring, uh, except with respect to four elements of the, of the BEPS project. Um, and and those, those elements, which were referred to as minimum standards, really didn't go to fundamental issues um, the way that this consensus uh, goes to the most fundamental issue. Um, the eighth on my list is the aggressive timeline. So we thought that the BEPS project had a, had a, had a, had a pretty ambitious timeline of starting in February of 2013 with the first report and issuing final reports of, uh, in um, October of 2015. Apparently having done that, the OECD is now looking to shave a year off of that and they issued the first report in this project in February of 2019 and they are saying they will reach full consensus by the end of 2015. And if they're keeping to the G20 schedule, the end of 2015 isn't December, it's November when the G20 leaders are scheduled um, to meet. That is a really aggressive timeline. Um, um, ninth on my list is the political element. Um, there is a huge political and public spotlight on this project. That was true of the BEPS project as well. Um, I think there are, there, there are both benefits and detriments to having that kind of attention paid. I know um, that I cringe every time I hear someone talk about the timeline in, in this current project as being, we will reach high level conceptual agreement by the end of 2019, and then we'll fill in the technical details. That, as a, as a tax person, it really hurts to think about the technical details being an afterthought, particularly when they're that fundamental. And since that took me to nine and I thought I should have 10 on my list, my last uh, comparison to the BEPS project is that this project lacks a catchy name. And if you have to say, addressing the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, every time you mention the project, you need to build another year or two into the project. <laughs> so perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps the OECD should come up with another a catchy name. Some, some use BEPS 2.0, um, but that I think understates the project because it's because it is it is in my view so much bigger than than BEPS than the BEPS project was. So with that, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the inclusive framework. Um, you see that all, that referenced all the time. Um, the inclusive framework has made decisions about this project. Things are being being um, studied by the inclusive framework. Um, it is an interesting, um, an interesting animal. Um, it was created after the release of the BEPS final reports. Um, it has been involved in all of the follow-up work on BEPS, and it has been involved in the current project, uh, the one with, without a name, um, 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 since, since, the, since the outset. Um, so in evaluating the, the current project and how it compares, um, I, I think the, the involvement of the inclusive framework um, is, a, is a really key factor. So currently, as I said, there are 134 jurisdictions that are members. Um, they hit 134 last month when Namib Namibia joined. Um, breakdown of the 134 members is 36 OECD members, two OECD accession countries, Colombia and Costa Rica, eight G20 countries that are not also members of the of the OECD, and that leaves 88 other jurisdictions, most of which were not involved in any of the development of the BEPS project and only were involved in the post-final reports work. Those 88 um, other countries include many that I couldn't find on a map, um, and many that, that didn't exist or didn't exist with their current names when I was in school. Um, there, there, there is significant um, um, presence of developing countries there also is, when you look at the list, a little bit surprising but significant presence of very low or no tax jurisdictions, jurisdictions that used to be called tax havens by the OECD, but they don't call them that anymore. Um, 
And, and those jurisdictions may have been, they may have been invited to participate in the, in the project on the grounds that, that the OECD was looking for a level playing field. And so one of their efforts at, at sort of bringing others into the, into the fold. Um, some may have decided to join the project because participating in the inclusive factor is a, a, a framework is a positive factor um, when you look at the um, EU blacklisting effort. Um, so it's a sort of, it's one of those good housekeeping seal of approval things. Um, there also are 14 um, international organizations and regional organizations that are participating in the project, including the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, the World Customs Organization, and a variety of regional tax organizations. So they're supporting the, the um, um, efforts of developing countries. Um, members, membership um, in the inclusive framework requires that the jurisdiction commit to the comprehensive BEPS package um, and pay an annual membership fee, which currently is um, 20,500 euro, although there are reduced rates available for developing, uh, developing countries. Um, and decisions on formal invitations to join the inclusive framework um, are made by the inclusive framework itself, um, working with the OECD Council. Um, so, so, so the group is really sort of tr truly open in the sense that uh, the group itself can decide um, who it invites to join. Uh, to join. The group was created through a mandate um, by the G20 in the fall of 2015. So in the G20 leaders communique coming out of that meeting, Turkey was the, was the chair then, included a sentence that said, to monitor the implementation of the BEPS project globally, we call on the OECD to develop an inclusive framework by early 2016 with the involvement of interested non-G20 countries and jurisdictions which commit to implement the BEPS project, including developing economies on an equal footing. So that was another point in the, in the BEPS project when I was really skeptical. Um, so even though the project had just, it just developed, it just delivered 15 final reports, I couldn't imagine that they could, could open the project up um, and have all these countries participate on an equal footing. Um, but very quickly, the, uh, the um, inclusive framework was developed by the OECD. It was endorsed um, in February 2016 by the G20 finance ministers. Um, and this time, um, their endorsement of it um, focused on the need to ensure a consistent global approach. Um, and um, also referenced, it, referenced their interest in, in recognizing and supporting the specific challenges that are faced by developing countries um, and that the implementation should be, their implementation cha challenges should be appropriately addressed. So the operating architecture of the inclusive framework um, um, covers membership, participation, and, and the focus areas. Um, they, um, it includes all interested and committed jurisdictions on an equal footing with the OECD and G20, so there's no longer a distinction um, um, in label. Um, they're all members of the inclusive framework, um, and they work on both BEPS standard setting and on BEPS Im implementation monitoring. And the uh, members um, of the inclusive framework participate in all the BEPS work at the Committee on Fiscal Affairs and all the technical working groups of the, uh, uh, of the OECD. So those groups that used to be um, people from 35 or 36 countries sitting around the table debating a comma um, in an article of the model treaty now could be up to 134 countries debating that comma. Um, um, and interestingly, not all of those countries that might debate that comma have signed on to the, to the model. Um, so it's a different, uh, a different dynamic. The, the, the framework's mandate is focused largely on the review of the implementation of the BEPS minimum standards, and those are rules related to harmful tax practices, addressing treaty abuse, country by country reporting, and improving um, dispute resolution. <laughs> the framework does have some other responsibilities, um, and they were set out in the original architecture um, as ensuring implementation of the rest of the BEPS um, package is not overlooked. It has not been, over, it has not been overlooked. 
um, thanks in large measure to the European Commission. Um, monitoring work related to, to the tax challenges of the digital economy and measuring the impact of, uh, of BEPS. So um, that those words did not, did not seem as significant um, in February of 2016 as they, as they seem today. Um, and then um, supporting countries in, the impl in, in, the, in implementation, particularly developing countries. The, uh, the, like all OECD um, bodies, the inclusive framework is, is um, governed through, through a steering committee, which has a mix of countries that is supposed to reflect the balance of the mix of uh, countries in the framework. And interestingly, the, the initial mandate of the, for, for the inclusive, inclusive framework is until 2020, although I have not, I have not heard any discussion of whether, whether that will be reviewed. Um, it, uh, um, it got up and running pretty quickly. First meeting was in um, June of 2016, and there were, at that point, there were 82 member countries. So 36 countries had, uh, were joining the OECD and G20 countries already in that first meeting. It, uh, um, um, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the inclusive framework has done some, some work on further standard setting with respect to BEPS. So while there were final reports issued in 2015, they weren't the last reports. And so the inclusive framework was, the, were, was involved in the delivery of some new transfer pricing guidelines, including gui guidelines related th that, have, that are under development related to financial services, some new treaty rules, um, and, and some, some additional standards in some other areas, as well as all of the guidance, uh, additional guidance that came out related to country-by-country uh, to -country reporting. Um, so some, some work that seems more like some of the traditional standard setting work or technical work of the OECD has been done um, and completed using this larger framework. But mostly the, the work has been um, um, focused on the minimum standards. And the minimum standards are those areas in the BEPS project where countries were required to commit. So it seems worthwhile to spend a little time looking at what those were since we're now looking at a project where the OECD is asking countries to commit. Um, so um, the, um, the, the um, final BEPS reports um, talks about the minimum standards um, and says this, that minimum standards were agreed in particular to tackle issues in cases where no action by some countries would have created negative spillovers including adverse impacts uh, on competitiveness in other countries. So um, that, the, in, that, in, that, in that way, minimum standards were quite different than, than looking for consensus on profit allocation. Because um, that's not just about negative spillovers, but about avoiding um, fundamental um, double taxation. Um, and then the OECD also said recognizing the need to level the playing field all OECD and G20 countries commit to consistent implementation. And so there, I think, and when you look at what the minimum standards are, um, they all have in common that they are things that uh, countries thought, some countries thought they should do, but didn't want to be alone in doing. So countries were interested in having country by country reporting, but they didn't want their companies to be the only ones that had to do, do that, that there was, that, that many of these minimum standards were in areas where countries wanted company if they were going to take the step. The, um, um, the, the um, 2015 report also reflected that um, the, the, the expectation that other countries would, um, would want to protect their own tax bases and so would decide to join this effort. The, um, so looking at the, at the minimum standards, um, first one is um, Action 5 on Harmful Tax Practices. That's work that, uh, that dated back in the OECD to 1998. Um, the work on um, harmful tax competition focused on what they then called tax havens, but also on preferential regimes within um, OECD countries. And so in 2000, the OECD identified 47 potentially harmful, harmful regimes 
In a 2006 report, the OECD concluded that 46 of those regimes had been abolished uh, or amended or were found to not actually be harmful. And the one, um, the one regime that was still outstanding when that report um, was issued has since been abolished. So the, at the Action 5 um, re reports, uh, the action, action 5 really updated the, the work on harmful tax practices in two ways. It incorporated a substantial activity requirement for any preferential regime. So, so it made the, the standards for preferential regimes um, significantly tougher. Um, um, uh, and, um, and it also established a requirement for spontaneous exchange of information on rulings. So for countries that had rulings, um, they needed to exchange information on those rulings with, with every sort of just w without, without request, just automatically, every country that could potentially be affected by the, by the ruling. Um, and so the first minimum standard related to this new substantial activity um, requirement, um, in the final report it was applied to IP regimes using a nexus approach. Um, and um, the um, a final report indicated that that, that, the, that that requirement also would be applied to other regimes and that was work to be done post issuance of the report. So that's an example of a, of a place where the inclusive framework was used to do some standard setting. Um, the, um, the, the second minimum standard is on, on this requirement to exchange information on rulings. Um, it applies um, not just to rulings related to preferential regimes, but to all rulings um, 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 where um, a lack of exchange could give rise to BEPS, BEPS concerns. So it's a pretty broad requirement. Um, and the final report set out a lot of, a, a lot of the mechani me mechanics for what, what, what kind of information needed to be exchanged, what rulings were covered, um, and um, uh, um, what, uh, the, the, the specific details that, that needed to be shared. The, um, so the ongoing work here of the inclusive framework is in monitoring what's happening with both of those minimum standards um, um, and, and also considerations of changes to those, uh, to those standards. So looking at the work on harmful preferential regimes, um, the peer review process had already been established um, um, before the before this project, and so it, what, what what the inclusive framework did was step into um, participating in that process, but it did develop guidance on on grandfathering. It de developed the substantial um, activity standard for non IP regimes, um, and it uh, um, developed guidance on data collection um, to. For, so for how the, the process would monitor regimes in operation. Um, it has, um, to date, has reviewed 290 regimes. Um, there are regimes, they, they are regimes in 75 inclusive framework countries. Um, also uh, regimes in three other countries, um, Jordan, Philippines, and St. Mar uh, Martin. Um, and it includes both um, IP regimes and, and non-IP regimes. Most of the regimes were found to be acceptable for one reason or another. They were out of scope, they weren't harmful, they'd been amended to be, uh, to, 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 to be consistent with the standards, they'd been abolished, um, they were potentially harmful but not actually harmful. So out of the 290 at this point, they have found four regimes to be harmful two of which are harmful only because they were amended but they had grandfathering rules that are more generous than the OECD standards would allow. And, and there are also 35 regimes that are still under review. Um, so on, on exchange of rulings, the, um, the inclusive framework had to develop the mechanics for reviewing what was happening with exchange of, of uh, of rulings, so they had to develop the peer review process and then implement it. Um, they, um, they've done two peer reviews um, um, to date, um, and um, the second one was, uh, um, um, was a follow-on to the first. Um, the second one was, was concluded at the end of last year, 
and they've reviewed 92 countries um, during 2017. Um, and at that point, there were um, 16,000 rulings that, it, that were in scope that had been issued by the end of 2017. Um, and there were 14,000 exchanges um, during 2017. The review included um, 45 non-OECD um, G20 countries um, that were members of the inclusive framework um, and those three jurisdictions that, that, that um, the OECD focused on in the prior um, aspect of the project. Um, 57 of the jurisdictions got through with no recommendations for any improvements needed. Um, um, one jurisdiction was deferred because of a hurricane. So the dog ate, the dog ate its homework, I guess. Um, um, 60, there were 60 recommendations that were for improvement were issued to 34 countries and it related to technical aspects of the, of the, of the, of the process. Um, and the, they'd been, they'd done a, the prior, of the prior review, there were 49 recommendations and, and a year later, 29 of those had been addressed and resolved. So the, the last thing that the inclusive framework did with respect to um, harmful tax practices was to expand the mandate um, and it related to low and no tax jurisdictions and the inclusive framework made the decision to, uh, to add a substantial activity requirement to the review of low or no tax jurisdictions. So it was a pretty significant standard setting by, by this larger body. And the first report was made again in December of last year. They reviewed 12 no or low tax jurisdictions that were members of the, of the um, inclusive framework. 11 of them were found to be not harmful um, because they had, had introduced economic substance requirements. Um, and the 12th um, had introduced an economic substance requirement, um, but was still in the process of addressing a technical point. So um, pretty significant uh, reviews there. The, the, um, with respect to country by country reporting, the minimum standard there, um, the, the OECD um, made recommendations with respect to master file, local file, and country by country reporting, but only the last is a minimum standard. Um, and countries committed to implement um, the common template that was included in the final report in a consistent manner um, and um, to an implementation plan to ensure that they were sharing information among jurisdictions in a timely manner with confidentiality preserved and that they were using the information in an appropriate manner, including a prohibition on using the country by country reporting information to support transfer pricing adjustments. Um, um, so one wonders really what they were using it for. They were using, they're supposed to use it as a risk assessment tool, but not as the support for, um, uh, for, the, for the adjustment. Um, the, um, since the final reports were issued, the inclusive framework has been involved in developing in, in issuing a lot of additional guidance on country by country reporting, including the mechanics uh, for the exchanges among among countries, um, and they developed a, a, a peer review process um, that um, that that has, is up and up and operational. Um, the peer review process first looked at w whether countries had the mechanism in place um, for collecting country by country reporting and requiring the filing of it. And then it looked at the exchange, uh, at the exchange mechanism. And the, um, um, at the, uh, the first report for 2017 found that there were 60 jurisdictions that had introduced legislation, uh, but, but, but some of them still needed to finalize it and, and get, it, get it activated. Um, there were, um, so 33 jurisdictions received recommendations that they needed to, to activate their, their, their frameworks um, for country by country reporting. And then there were um, specific recommendations were issued to 20, 28 jurisdictions for improvements. And so some of the improvements were, in, were kind of in the weeds. The US got one of those recommendations and the fault in the US rules was that for tax exempt entities, the US re required as the revenue number reporting only uh, unrelated 
um, business income um, and, and not all revenue. Um, and that merited a recommendation, which the U.S. has not yet acted on. Um, so they were getting pretty far into the weeds. The more recent, uh, the most recent um, peer, peer review report came out earlier this month. They're up to, up to looking at 116 jurisdictions. More than 80 now have the, have the framework in place. Um, but, but 41 jurisdictions got recommendations that they needed to get, their, get, get the framework in place and start to activate it. Um, and, uh, and there were similar recommendations for improvements, including the U.S. still needing to address that tax-exempt entity um, issue. Um, 67 jurisdictions now have agreements in place for the exchange of country-by-country -country reporting, um, and there have been over 2,200 exchanges. Um, or there are over 2,200 exchange relationships in place. The... Um, um, uh, what, one thing that was interesting, so one of the issues that they were um, looking at was confidentiality. Um, and I was quite surprised to see in the report um, that they did review confidentiality. That, w that review was done by the Global Forum on Information Exchange because they said it had expertise. Um, but, they, but, but they also said that it involved sensitive issues um, um, and non-public information on jurisdictions, internal systems and procedures and therefore that the, the, the results of that review would, be, would remain confidential and no details were provided in the report. So it's been reviewed, but we don't know what happened. Um, the, um, uh, um, the OECD has indicated that, that country by country reporting that mechanism will be reviewed um, in 2020 uh, and um, there, we expect there to be a public consultation early next year um, that, that is an aspect of the BEPS project that will be significantly affected by the current project that will require new and very different reporting um, if they go forward with, uh, with, with the rules that they're looking at. So the, the, the um, next minimum standard was on dispute resolution um, and um, the, it, uh, the, the final report sets out a, a, a commitment requires countries make a commitment to a minimum standard on specific measures to remove obstacles to effective and efficient um, um, mutual agreement procedures um, and mandates establishing a monitoring mechanism. Um, there was also a subgroup of countries that committed to, to mandatory bind, bind, binding arbitration, but that was not part of the minimum standard uh, because not everyone was willing to do that. The, um, the, the um, focus of the minimum standard is on the, um, um, whether the treaty obligations with respect to MAP are fully implemented and whether ca cases are timely resolved, um, whether the administrative pro processes uh, prevent, um, uh, promote prevention of disputes and timely resolution of disputes, and whether taxpayers have real and effective access to, to MAP. The um, inclusive framework took those three objectives and turned it into 21 specific elements um, that then have been the subject of, of a couple of, uh, of peer, they're, they're just starting the stage two peer reviews. Um, the, um, so they've got a complicated process for looking at, at countries um, um, six, six or eight countries at a time, um, and then all of the participants in the inclusive framework review the country's reports of their own, their own status and have the opportunity to comment on their experience as a MAP partner. Um, so there's back and, back and forth. And the um, first stage reports were issued in, in started to be issued in September of, of 2017. Um, <laughs> And um, they were voluminous reports. The, um, um, the stage two, the stage two reports that review um, the progress made by jurisdictions. Uh, the first one was issued last month. Um, and again, most of the identified deficiencies um, have been um, addressed. And um, 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 most countries have met the. 24-month time um, 
limit for case resolution. The U.S. has not. The U.S. is at 27 months, although down from 30 mo 31 months, uh, which is where it was in the first um, um, uh, 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 review a year earlier. And the, the results so far are showing that countries have an increase in the caseload, um, which is likely to increase further if they go forward with the rest of uh, this uh, uh, current project. Um, the last minimum standard relates to preventing treaty abuse, and that really is linked to the multilateral instrument because it is about committing to put into your treaties either principal purpose test or a limitation on benefits test or some combination of both. Um, and so um, the, um, they de they've developed a, a peer review process with respect to that. They've done the first round of peer review um, with, um, um, again, voluminous reports um, as, to, as to what's happening, but most of the implementation uh, of, the, of the rules with respect to, uh, uh, to this standard um, it's tied up with the, with the multilateral instrument that has many signatories, but so far only a few that have effectuated um, the, the, um, the agreement, and so it's in the early stages. So the, the most recent uh, peer review report had in the single digit number of treaty relationships that had been um, changed to incorporate one of these standards by reason of activation of the multilateral instrument. Uh, but that those peer reviews will, will continue as well. So the, the, o, the OECD, through this inclusive framework, has been doing a lot of monitoring of commitments. Um, I'm not sure that the results of that monitoring, um, how, how one would evaluate the results of that monitoring, monitoring in what are still early days. Um, in some cases, a third of the jurisdictions have not yet put their commitments in place. Um, in, others, in other places, the number is much higher. With respect to the treaty-based rules, the, the number is much higher just because of the length of time involved in the multilateral instrument process. I was surprised to see how much work the inclusive framework had done on standard setting, um, sort of more detailed technical work. Um, and it does have experience there. Um, and so I think all of that is important um, as you look forward um, and think about, again, thinking at the, at the current project and the reality that the current project um, involves uh, a, 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 at least one element, at least the profit allocation and nexus rules the OECD is doing in the form of full consensus, commitment to implement and to apply consistently. Um, the, the minimum tax rules, the OECD has indicated that, that that will be more like a best practices framework. If you choose to have minimum tax rules, they should be done this way, uh, but, not a, but not a full commitment. So circling back um, and thinking about this project, I feel like um, the, the BEPS project um, involved more cooperation among, across a greater number of countries post post-completion of the project than, than I had really focused on. The inclusive framework um, has is been up and running for longer and more and has more experience than, than I had thought. Um, um, but, look at, but, but I guess my takeaway is I think the development of the inclusive framework is probably a positive for the international tax rule and, and maybe particularly a positive for this um, specific project if uh, if if consistent application and implementation is the only key to eliminating double taxation, then businesses need more countries involved, not fewer. And so the, 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 the fact that there's broad scope here seems like, a, seems like a, a positive and perhaps seems like the right direction for, the, for future work on, on international tax, although it certainly complicates things because you have much greater diversity and experience level in, in domestic law, in um, history with the, with, with the core instruments like the model treaty and the transfer pricing guidelines. Um, politi political involvement um, is, is a fact of this project. Um, maybe, may, maybe one could, could say it is a positive 
in that um, the commitments to this project need to be real. Um, and so they're probably not commitments that could be made at the level of um, David and I and others. When, when we were in the, in the Treasury Department, you, you really, it really needs to be a political level commitment when you're committing to something that, uh, that, that could involve significant swings in the revenue of a, of a, of a country. The aggressive timeline, um, I, I certainly am a believer in, in deadlines focusing one's attention. Um, I know that I started to work a lot harder on my term paper when, when, when it was just a week away, but I also believe that deadlines need to be realistic um, and feasible. And so that dream that we've all had, that you, that you wake up in the morning and uh, discover your term paper is due that day and you didn't even know you were taking the class, that, that does not galvanize you to do anything productive. Um, and so I, I continue to be concerned about the, the timelines with which the OECD is saying they're, they're, they intend to, to pursue this project. The, kinds of de the kind of detailed work that really needs to be done both by transfer pricing experts um, and, um, and treaty experts, the input that's needed from the business community that understands the practicality of this doesn't seem, it doesn't seem possible to synthesize all of that um, in, the, in the time allowed unless that time is allowed to expand. Um, and then I guess I would say that um, really, I, I, I think what this, what this exercise taught me is that what really concerns me about this project is the fact that it involves fundamental, a fundamental relook at the, at, the, at the international tax architecture. Um, and that to me still seems like um, a daunting uh, a daunting task, um, perhaps better done with more countries than fewer, um, but but not an easy task. Um, I'm going to throw open the floor to some questions, if there are any out there. Uh, I have, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the first question, and you are ideally placed to have a reaction to this, but you may not want to, <laughs> uh, which is this. Um, I, I, there seems to me to be a, uh, uh, a gap between what's going on in the international organization community, and which is widely reported, and uh, your, your uh, lecture today was a very um, ambitious summary of what's been happening, and a lot has been happening. But there seems to me to be a, a, a sort of a discontinuity between that and what would be necessary to put in place any kind of implementing rules. And I'm, I'm curious as to what extent the political factors in this country are even following this. I, I know that businesses are, because they, they're very concerned. They're, they're sort of pawns and what seems to be a worldwide game, but are the political actors in this country, you had two stints in, in the Congress. Uh, I recently had occasion, by the way, to tell somebody at IFA never to confuse what the statements of one branch of the United States government <laughs> with statements of the United States. That's a mistake people make. Just because the Treasury says something doesn't mean it's gonna happen. So my question is, I mean, what, where is Congress in all this? Where, where are the, where, where, are they following it? Are, are there people actively well, that's an aware? That's an interesting question. Um, and I would say that, they're, that the tax writing committees are following it somewhat, but they're not really following it because of the OECD project. They're following it because of their concern about digital services taxes around the world um, and their objection to those taxes when they target U.S. companies. So earlier this year, we saw a bipartisan, bicameral joint statement from the chairman and ranking members of the two tax writing committees, which might be the only such statement we see in the entire Congress, um, um, condemning the French digital services tax when it reached some milestone back in April, and saying that the issues needed to be addressed in a, in a, in a cooperative, and coordinated fashion through the mechanism of the OECD. That, that gave me pause. 
um, until I saw that they did include a second paragraph that said, we look forward to reading the results of the, of the, uh, of the OECD project um, and evaluating its implications for the US FISC. So they were not endorsing the results of the project, but they were saying that it would be better to address those issues um, 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 in a coordinated way and not through unilateral <coughs> measures. But whether, the, I d but I don't believe that there's much that, that there's much attention being paid to the detail of the project, and I and I think it's important that um, businesses should be talking to, to to members and staff about it. From the Treasury Department perspective, the U.S. Treasury is 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 really a driving force in this project in a in a way that is fairly unusual for OECD projects. Um, often the U.S. takes a more cautious approach with respect to the OECD. Um, but on this project, again, I think largely because of the link to digital services taxes, the, the U.S. Treasury is very much driving this forward. And so you've seen um, Secretary Mnuchin comment on it, um, um, and, and obviously uh, Chip Harder is spending a great deal of time on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Questions from the floor? Anybody want to uh, ask Barbara anything about this? This is uh, one of the major international tax developments of our time. Mike Leonard. Yeah, well, you, yeah, sure. Uh, Mike Leonard, from the UN, but not speaking for the UN. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Barbara. It's very good to, to have such a sort of broad level experience. But there are critics of the inclusive framework and, and uh, you know, I know some people who are participating in that and they say, well, you know, what could we do? We have to begin it, but, but the nature of the beast, the speed, you know, the difficulty in us, you know, with the unified approach not even yet being public, we, we can't really analyse it in time. There's meant to be a political commitment at the end of this year, you know, how are we going to explain to our ministers what the impact is? Even the role of the secretariat, which is so important, and the key secretariat people involved are, are not from developing countries, they're from traditional countries. Again, this is not a, no, a UN view, it's not even my personal view, but how do you address this, this issue of, you know, at the hearts and minds of non-OECD countries there, and if they're not there, does, will that matter in the implementation? I'm just uh, interested in your perspective on the fact that there, there are these criticisms. I think, that's, I think that's an important point. There's involvement in the OECD, and when you think about the involvement in all of these, all of these working groups, um, you, can, you can spend all of your time in Paris. Right. Um, um, and, and, and most people, particularly with, with, with in, from the members of the inclusive framework, have real jobs back at home in their capital, and they can't spend all of their time on, on, on this project. And so, um, and, and, th and that's exacerbated by the, by the short time frame. Um, I, I think that that is a real worry. I think you, you do need the hearts and minds of, of countries in this project, because the commitment can't just be on paper. Um, it's not just a commitment that I support something. It, they have to, for this to work, everybody has to live that commitment and do transfer pricing in a different way, including adopting formulas that may seem arbitrary and might cost you revenue in a case, but you have to, it, this only works if everyone does that. And so to me, the consensus has to be fully informed and, and at this speed and with the, the amount of, uh, of pressure, is, will it really be fully informed? Yeah. David. So I, I appreciate this. Uh, I'm David Hardy. Uh, I'm, I appreciate your comment on the, uh, on the inclusiveness of this procedure. Uh, but one of the things that you mentioned was that the uh, low tax and no tax jurisdictions are participating in this. In, in pillar two of the digital uh, regime, uh, there is a minimum tax which would allow or encourage other countries to apply a sort of a sop up tax if the low tax country does not tax. Uh, to me, that seems like such a fundamental assault on sovereignty as to be impossible of resolution. Uh, this may not be the only one, but do you think this can be resolved? 
probably is why, or certainly might be one of the reasons why the OECD concluded that the global minimum tax part of the project doesn't need to be consensus. It's a, it's a recommendation or a, or, a, or a best practice should you choose to follow it. Um, but, but it is hard to imagine when you look at the list of, list of countries um, that are participating, how are, they, how are they participating in discussions about which country gets the right to, to apply a soak up tax to, to, peop, to, to businesses that have operations in their, in their jurisdiction. Um, th those would be interesting meetings to be a fly on the wall for. Do we have any other questions from the floor? All right, well with that, I'm gonna invite everybody. We're gonna have a brief reception at the, at the rear of the room. You have an opportunity to talk to Barbara. I have lots of questions myself, but I don't wanna monopolize all the talk. So thank you very much, Barbara. It was very interesting.